questions throughout the, the presentation, you're welcome to ask them. And since the microphone might not be able to pick it up, I'll just repeat your question and then address it. Uh, so my background is in entomology. I focused on studying insects and ag systems. And a lot of times students think that's weird and they ask me, why did you focus on insects? Why do you love insects? And it's not so much that I, I love insects, it's more that it's, it is close to a $1 trillion industry in controlling them and preventing their spread as efficiently as possible. So I do teach at Cal Poly and before I started teaching at the university, I actually worked for the government. I worked for the United States Department of Agriculture as a field biologist, specifically in the forests in Southern California. And then from there, I went and worked for the state of California, Cal Department of Food and Ag, doing the same thing all over the, well, all over the southern part of the state. Um, most of my time was spent dealing with growers who were sending shipments of non-edible plants, so ornamental horticulture, decorative plants being shipped all over the state. And there was a tremendous amount of paperwork involved. And a lot of people were confused. Like, why, why is there paperwork when I send shipments of plants from Riverside County into Kern County, into Tulare, or, or anywhere up in the northern part of the state? Well, that's an interesting topic. That's one of the things we're going to talk about in this lecture. If you notice, we've got a lot on the board already. You've got government regulations, economics, and marketing. I mean, these are all three different topics that you could spend four to six years in, in college studying specifically. So we're really just going to talk about some of the main points of each of these um, without diving too much in depth in any one of them. I teach this in multiple classes. I teach it in my food marketing class. Uh, I teach this in, in um, a number of ag business courses as well. It's taught in our ag econ also. So I want you to take away right off the bat that ag is a lot more than just food. Agriculture is significantly more than just food. But in layman's terms, people think it's really just, well, you're just going to water some seeds and you're going to grow some plants and that's agriculture. And that, that's only a fraction of the truth. A big part of agriculture to me is producing textiles for clothing. And I think you really need to take a step back and think, wow, there's 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet. Not only do they have to eat, but they also have to wear clothes. Both of those are, are agricultural aspects of society. And then you got to think, well, how do you clothe 7.7 .7 billion people? Feeding that many people is already its own challenge, and producing clothing for them is, is a really big deal as well. Um, so that's why I have food and fiber here. I mean, you do have to produce calories for your population to consume, but you also need to clothe them as well. And that brings up dozens and dozens and dozens of problems, very serious problems that are really difficult to tackle that, that pose a lot of ethical and economic dilemmas. Uh, so think about some of these things as we go through the lecture. I don't want you to be thinking about these as far as feeding your family of four, but I also want you to think about it as feeding your population of 330 million people in the United States or feeding your population of a billion people on a continent. Think about it from those perspectives. So why is it that sometimes you can go to the store and you can buy, I mean, I'm just going to throw out arbitrary numbers here, that I can go buy a gallon of milk for $3 in one month, and then I can come back four months later and now it's $3.50. You might be thinking, well, 50 cents, um, is that really that big of a deal? But think about how many gallons of milk are sold across the state or across the country. That 50 cents change, that 50 cents fluctuation, could equal millions and millions and millions of dollars of, of price changes. Why? Like, why did it go up 50 cents in a matter of months? And, and we can answer some of those questions through ag economics, but I also want you to be thinking more outside of the economics of it, as far as the ethical perspective of it, well, what about people who don't have a whole lot of money where that 50 cents change is extremely significant in the budget of feeding their family? I think these are really important topics you need to be addressing constantly. Why is it that food is significantly cheaper in the United States than if you go to the Middle East, if you go to certain parts of Europe? That's a hard question to answer, too. I mean, we can draw some, some pretty good conclusions based on some empirical data and some other concepts in economics. But why is it that food is so much cheaper in the United States? Something that we take for granted here, and we can answer some of those questions through ag economics. Um, should people who are rich and people who are poor have same access to the same food at the same prices? I'm not, I mean, these are rhetorical questions. I'm not saying that I believe one way or the other. I just want you to be thinking about that. Should somebody who is one of top 1% of earners have the same access to food as someone in the, uh, the bottom 10%? Think about those things as we go through some of these slides. So a lot of these questions are rhetorical because there isn't a straightforward answer on them. There are many, many people with PhDs in economics, PhDs in mathematics that are trying to figure out the most efficient ways to do some of these things, right? So if, if there's a question posed here and it's difficult and we don't come to a straightforward answer, just understand that that's, that's just 
the way some of these concepts are, uh, it's very difficult to address them. So right off the bat, let's think about, well, how do we get food to 7.7 .7 billion people? And let's lower that number for the sake of simplicity. Let's talk about just the United States. How do we get food to 330 million people in the United States? Well, we are already doing that pretty efficiently, but what could we do differently? What we could, could we do better? And for the most part, nobody wants to go pay more for their food. There's a very small niche market of people who are really into organic food that want to pay more for their food, and that's a whole different topic too. But how do we make food as cheap as possible for as many people as possible? These are all concepts in ag economics. But it's also concepts in marketing, and it's also concepts in government regulation. And I'll explain why that is in a few more slides. I just want to kind of lay the foundation here. Um, so keep in mind, we're trying to get people as much food and fiber as possible for a, as low of a cost as possible. And it comes down to this very basic supply and demand. I, know, I'm, I hope many of you were exposed to this in, in high school. Um, if you had to take an economics class at the college level, this is one of the first things they teach you. And if you, if you can talk about the basics of this chart, you can deal with economics at a really high level, whether that's good or bad. It's, it's the concept of supply and demand. And I can give you a couple different examples here, but the main, co the main concept is if something is rare and hard to find, the demand and the price of it is very high. And the most basic example of that would be something like gold, a precious metal. There's a finite amount of it. It's highly sought after. Um, the supply is low, so the demand is high. The supply is low down here, so the demand will be really high. The price will be really high because there's, there's fewer or less of it. Well, on the flip side of that, if every farmer in the country decided to farm only corn, and, there go, and let's say weather wasn't a factor, you can go corn wherever you want, everybody just starts flooding the market with corn. The supply of corn goes up, 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 more and more and more and more. Corn is being produced. Well, the demand is going to be really low and the price is going to be really low because there's so much of it flooding the market. These are really important to understand when you look at food prices. I mean, government regulation is going to come in. That's the next step. But these basic concepts of how much of it, available in the, how much of it is available in the market can really tell you how much that stuff is going to cost. And I've got some other charts to kind of help explain that too. Then I've got three or four slides here with, with some definitions. My style of presenting is not so much to show you definitions and read them off to you, uh, but I want to get through some of these slides kind of quickly just because you do need to understand what these concepts are. Surplus and a deficit. Most of the time when we're dealing with economics, agricultural economics, we're primarily going to be looking at a deficit when we don't have enough of something. And when we don't have enough of something, the price of it goes up, um, the demand for it usually goes up too. And there's some psychology that, that factors into that as well. Um, people tend to want something that is rare, tend to want something that they might not have access to later on down the road. Uh, surplus is important to understand too uh, when we have too much of something or an excessive amount of something. That can happen in agriculture, but for the most part, we're dealing with something as, as far as a deficit. And I'll give you a quick example. Um, about nine or 10 years ago, uh, uh, I was working at a restaurant, and we had to stop selling our onion products because it cost the restaurant too much money to be buying onions. I didn't understand it at the time, but now, now I realize what was going on was there was a huge shortage of onion production. And the reason being, there was a combination of some sort of freak weather system rolled through that was, was unkind to onion growing. And I'm not a grower, so I don't exactly, I'm not going to speak on that specifically. So the weather changed and the onions weren't growing as well, very well. Also, a virus kind of swept through that was attacking onions. And there wasn't as much yield as normal. So there were, there were less onions being grown. The demand and the cost went up. And the restaurant couldn't afford to buy them anymore. So most of the time in agriculture, we're going to be looking at things like a deficit. And this happens a lot if you have a tremendous amount of corn and soybean being grown in, in parts of this country. And if we have some sort of strange weather come through where it cuts the yield down even 15%, that is going to fluctuate prices pretty significantly. And it's not always uniform. It's not like if we lose 15% of our yield, do prices go up 15%? No. Usually it's much more drastic than that. Prices can go up a lot more than 15% due to a 15% loss in the crop. But that's getting a little bit too specific. Those are the types of questions ag economists try to answer all the time, though. So opportunity cost is super important to understand as well. And this is something I tell all my college students um, as far as not only are you paying tuition to come to college for three to four years, you're giving up three to four years of the prime of your life where you could be doing something else. 
Now, I'm not saying that any of you in here should be doing something else. I think you should be in college. I think that's a wise decision. But I still want you to think about, all right, if I'm from 18 years old to 22 years old and I go and get a bachelor's degree, well, you're giving up the opportunity costs of four years of you studying something else or working and earning money doing something else. That is an opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is important in farming as well. And farming is really just the surface of this. I mean, opportunity cost is applicable to any field. But when you think about if you're a farmer and you're going to grow 200 acres of something, opportunity cost is something you really need to consider. Do you grow 200 acres of the same crop? Do you grow 200 acres of 10 different crops? What if we have 90% of that yard growing one crop and the other 10% varied between five or six different crops? Why? Why do you make these decisions? What's your strategy? What's the science behind it? What is the economics behind the decisions that you're making? But also, what's the opportunity cost? That's a really interesting thing to discuss. And I don't, I'm trying not to go off on too many tangents, one, because we are filming this and we, we only have about 45 minutes. But um, there's some cool stories and studies to cite here as far as what is the most strategic way to farm to use your land as a farmer. And ag economics can explain some of these things. This definition ties hand in hand with our last one of opportunity cost, but the economies of scale here. When you're doing something, the bigger scale that you do it on drives the costs of you operating your business down substantially. Now, I'm going to give you a really quick story, and these aren't exact numbers. This is kind of arbitrary just to try to explain the concept. Let's say you're going to grow an acre of corn. And again, just arbitrary names here. You're going to grow an acre of corn. You have, this is, you've never done this before, right? So you need to purchase the acre. Let's say you're going to lease it, whatever. You acquire the, the acre. Well, you're going to have to go buy corn seeds. You may even have to lease those genetics from someone like Monsanto or Bayer. It happens all the time. Syngenta as well. So we have to buy the acre of land. We have to lease those genetics. What about, I have to buy a tractor. I have to buy some sort of equipment. Um, I'm going to need to hire some labor. I'm going to need to buy pesticides. These are all things that I have to do to grow an acre of corn. Well, after you've already got that acre established, what if like, okay, I want to buy another acre of corn. Great. You don't have to do all those same things you just did. You may be able to use the same labor, just pay them a couple extra hours or whatever to, to farm the, the other acre. You don't need to buy any more equipment. You've already purchased the tractor from the first acre. And you're already seeing, okay, the costs of doing business on that initial acre are really high, but the costs of doing business on the second, third, and fourth acre all drop down substantially. Now, I want you to think about that if you're a farmer. If I've got 10 acres of 10 different crops, that means you're going to need 10 different types of equipment, probably, or more than one. You're going to need 10 different types of pesticides, 10 different types of seeds, 10 different types of IPM strategies, and all those could potentially cost money. 10 different types of strategies and inputs as opposed to just growing one thing. Well, generally speaking, and, and there is some science that can counter this a little bit, but generally speaking, if you're a farmer, you are going to be most efficient at only growing one thing. Just specialize in one commodity and grow just that one commodity. And I'm not saying that's the best decision in all scenarios, but there is some. If you're trying to just produce as many calories as possible, you're better off probably growing just one commodity. And again, this is a big debate right now in sustainable agriculture. Should we do a monoculture? Should we do a polyculture? And the end goal isn't always necessarily to produce as many calories as possible. And all of a sudden, you're probably thinking, wow, this is a little bit more complicated than I thought. And it is complicated. Agriculture is super complicated. But what I like about it is if, if you, and I, I'm pretty sure everyone in this room applies to this, if you have to eat food, and I've never met anybody who doesn't, you are participating in agriculture, you are participating in ag economics already. It's pretty cool. And that's not even to talk about having to drink water and how we, how we the economics of our water system either. I mean, that's an even more, more complicated topic. Um, outsourcing is an important concept to understand. It does take place in agriculture as well. You're probably familiar with what outsourcing is. It's when it costs the company significantly less that they save money to outsource an aspect of their business to either another business or another country. Uh, an industry that's infamous for doing this is like telecommunications, like T-Mobile, Verizon, and AT&T. Um, a lot of times they hire call centers out of a country like India. So if you, need, if you have issues with your AT&T service and you call AT&T, there's a good chance it's not going to an AT&T building in the United States. It could go to a call center in another country. Why? Because it saves AT&T a tremendous amount of money and labor costs to do it in a different country. The ethics of that is a different discussion for an entirely different class. Well, what about outsourcing in agriculture? It happens all the time. 
One of the things I used to do for the state was China was a gigantic purchaser of citrus from California. And you might be thinking like, well, why? Because China has a tremendous citrus industry, multi, multi-billion dollar citrus industry. Why are they buying citrus from across the world from the United States? Well, in a sense, they're outsourcing their farming because they have such an extreme population. They've ran out, well, I'm not going to say they've ran out of land, but they don't have any more land available, whether it's weather or populations, um, to grow more citrus. So they kind of, in a sense, outsource it to the United States. We'll just buy citrus from California. And that, I'll tell you this very briefly because I don't want to use up too much of my time. Uh, when you go to the store, like I'm going to say an average store here. I'm not talking about something like Whole Foods or Trader Joe's. Um, if you're going to go to the average grocery store and buy citrus, you are not buying California's best citrus. You're buying their grade B and C citrus. The best citrus, grade A, pristine citrus, gets sold to the highest bidder. And that's also a concept in economics. I mean, you're going to sell to whoever's willing to pay you the most. Who's willing to pay the most for California citrus? Not Californians. The people that want to pay the most for this are South Korea, Japan, and China. So a lot of my job was inspecting citrus, making sure it met certain protocols and certain chemical treatments before we could ship it across the seas to these other countries. That's a crude example of how outsourcing works. It's, it's easier to explain those concepts outside the field of agriculture, but it's still important to understand how these things work, especially in textile production more so than food production this, is, this data is, is a few years old. It's very offensive data even at these numbers, but it's, it's worse now if we were to look at these numbers in 2020. Over here on the left, this is what it would cost. Let's say you and I start a clothing business, a textile business. We're going to start producing some shirts. This is roughly how much it would cost us to produce the shirt in the United States. We're going to spend about 75 cents on industrial laundry. We're going to spend $5 on material. And then we have to spend $7.50 in labor costs. That's how much it's going to cost us to pay another human being to sew this shirt together somewhere. Well, that's in the United States. If we want to do this in a different country, we can, we can hire people in Bangladesh to do this for 22 cents an hour compared to us having to pay $7.50 an hour. And again, this, this data is old. Uh, if you were to do this, you wouldn't do this in California for the exact reason of labor costs. You'd probably go to a different state. Uh, but you can get the idea, okay, well, we have minimum wage regulations in the United States. Right off the bat, okay, there's one of our key terms, re government regulations. And you might think, well, minimum wage is not a government regulation that pertains to agriculture. And you're wrong. It absolutely does. We have a tremendous amount of low-wage labor in agriculture. And when the government steps in and tries to, or, it, well, they do, not try to, they do, set forth regulations on the minimum amount you can pay someone for an hour of their work, well, that changes input costs for businesses. And again, this isn't an ethical discussion. That's a different topic. But uh, whether or not you think minimum wage should not exist, be lower or be higher, is irrelevant to the discussion. It's important to understand how much businesses have to play their pay their employees is it has a direct correlation to how much these products will cost at some point. Um, so you might think, well, and, and this is also, man, this is kind of a, just a rough thing to talk about, but I guarantee you probably everybody in this room, not, not probably, I think I can say with 99.9% .9 certainty that everybody in this room is wearing an article of clothing that was put together by a child in another country under really, really harsh conditions. I mean harsh conditions compared to uh, anything that you, you possibly think of. I mean, there's been a lot in the news about, man, all oh, these Walmart distribution center workers and Amazon distribution center workers are working in really harsh conditions. And, and sure, it may be harsh conditions, relatively speaking, but these are not harsh conditions compared to other parts of the planet. And I'm not saying we shouldn't fix some of those conditions, but I'm just saying I'm talking about conditions that are really, really bad, like 16-hour workdays at less than a U.S. dollar per hour, no bathroom breaks, uh, working at literally six to eight years old. I mean, this happens all the time all over the planet. Should the government step in and say you can't do X, Y, and Z? Well, that's one of the big discussions in government agriculture. And I'll give you some examples more so how they pertain to c calorie production and food as opposed to textiles. But one more important statistic about that uh, as far as sweatshop conditions work. And I like to give a separate lecture on sweatshops specifically because that is, that is an aspect of agriculture because you've got to produce clothing for people. There is a direct correlation between the number of impoverished people in an area of the world and the likelihood that sweatshops exist in that place. 
And in short, it's because it's easier to exploit those types of employees when there's a tremendous amount uh, of impoverished citizens. So if you look at countries with the highest number of poor, like Bangladesh, you're going to see the highest number of children laborers, children being, I'm going to say, exploited in the workforce. Um, but then again, not all aspects of sweatshops are negative. But again, a little bit different of a discussion for a different topic, a different lecture. This is something that is, is extremely important you understand. In the United States, you pay by far the least amount of your disposable income on food. That is something you should be extremely proud of and extremely thankful for. I, there are a, a number of things our country needs to improve on significantly, and we should strive to improve those things, a number of them. But one thing that is amazing about this country is that we pay by far the least amount of our disposable income on calories. And what the, the definition of disposable income will change depending on what, what economic, economic textbook you're using. For the, to put it as simply as possible, it's how much money do you have left over after you pay rent? That's the loose definition. How much money do you have left over after you pay your rent? That's your disposable income. And here in the United States, you're going to spend the least amount of that on food than anywhere else in the country. So you can see going from right to left, it's like, okay, the U United Kingdom's pretty good, then Canada's pretty good. Well, what about Mexico, Ukraine, and Pakistan? You're spending significantly more of your disposable income on food. It is harder to feed yourself economically in those parts of the world than it is in the United States. As far as equality goes, it's, we should be asking the question, why? I mean, how can we make more equal or make more regular, and then hence the, where the, the, the term regulate came from, regulations, regulate, to make regular. How can we spread equality across this to make everybody on the planet spending the same amount of money on food? Is it fair or equal that in, in the Ukraine you spend almost 40% of your disposable income on food, whereas in the United States you're spending about 7 to 8% of your disposable income on food? I mean, really, go to Target and load up your cart with bags of rice, bags of dried beans, bags of, of canned food, and you realize it's really inexpensive to feed yourselves here. That's important, something we should be really, really thankful for. Now, you might be thinking, food costs a lot of money, man. I go to Chili's, I bought a cheeseburger for 12 bucks, I go to fast food, I spend six, seven dollars on fast food. That's not an efficient use of your money as far as buying calories with it. You can buy a decent amount of calories with one hour's worth of minimum wage in California. Now, I'm not saying California's minimum wages should be higher or lower, it's not, that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just trying to say if you do go work an hour, you can buy a pretty good amount of calories if you manage your budget properly. But then, different discussion. So going forward with this, well, what should the functions of agriculture be? Should it be just to produce as many calories as possible? Should it be to try to produce as many different types of calories? Like, what if we shouldn't just grow corn and soybean? What if we should try to grow a polyculture of 20 different types of crops? Well, there's easy ways to, on the surface, answer why we do some of these things. Because we want to have our prices as low as possible for our population, it makes sense to produce as much of, as possible of something. Corn, and whether or not you feel good or bad about this, is kind of irrelevant. Corn is a byproduct. There are byproducts of corn in almost everything that you eat. Well, because corn is grown in such substantial numbers in the United States, it drives prices of all those things down. It makes it easy, easier to ship these commodities, easier to market them, easier to price them, as in the price point will be a little bit lower. Well, that's good for you and I as the consumer. It means we don't have to spend as much of our money, as of our money on food. Well, there's some downsides too, but the point that I'm trying to make is there isn't a straightforward answer to some of these questions. What should the function of agriculture be? It's not as simple as just grow food. It's wildly more complex than that. Um, how important are these changes in commodity prices? Is it like, well, Mexico pays more for their food than we do, and who cares? Should the conversation just end there? Well, not necessarily. I mean, what should we do about it? I mean, our highest levels of p political officials can't decide these. They, they can't figure this out. It's complicated. And that's just within our own government. And think about how difficult it would be to communicate with governments of other countries when our own government can't get along with each other. It's, hard, it's a hard thing to do. Um, most of all, who gets impacted the most by some of these things? Like if there's a storm that wipes out corn or, or certain government regulations are in place, who's going to be impacted? Are the farmers going to be impacted more than the people buying their commodities? I don't know. It's going to be scenario dependent. These are things you've got to be thinking about. 
And underlined in red here because it is an extremely important question, how much should the government step in and make decisions? If you're a business, should you have complete free range as, as far as what you should be able to do? Like, look, I buy 10 acres. If I have some people that want to work for me for $5 an hour, I don't think the government should tell me no. If I have people who are willing and able and consenting to work for me for $5 an hour, should I have to pay them more? I'm not saying yes or no, but I will tell you the government is saying yes, you have to pay them a minimum wage. That minimum wage varies depending on where you go in the country. There's federal and state levels of it. Well, what if, you know, I've got some chemicals and I want to spray them on my crop because I've got these darn insects and they're costing me a lot of money. I've got these insects eating all my corn. They're causing me to lower my yield. I don't have as much. I'm not making as much money. But I've got some chemicals I want to spray on them. Should you be allowed to just go spray poison whenever you want under any conditions and under any circumstances? Well, the government says no. There are a tremendous amount of regulations on when and how you can use poisons on your crop as well. Um, should I be able to distribute my crops whenever I want? Well, no. The government says you can't do that either. You need certain paperwork when you ship these commodities across borders. And I could go on and on and on. My point being, there is a time when the government has to come in and try to make regular, whether it's for safety reasons, whether it's for ethical reasons. These are things that you really, the average person doesn't think about too much when we're talking about spreading food all over the place. Shipping food, I should say. This is a cool picture that I, I, I didn't fact check the validity of this, okay, but it, the point is still holds true. You've got all these smaller brands around the side of the picture, and in the middle, you've got two, four, six, eight, ten major corporations, may, maybe 11 major corporations. And what I'm showing you here is that when you go to the store, you looks like you've got a lot of different freedom in the products that you could be buying. And for the most part, all these products are pretty much complete garbage that you probably shouldn't be eating anyway. But my point being, all these items on the, the outside really funnel into the same 10 or so companies. Well, that's kind of interesting to think about. Like, why? Well, that's a whole different discussion for a graduate level business course, as, as long as some psych psychologists having some input there as well. How we market food, how I try to get you to buy my product has a tremendous amount of psychology involved in it. What colors I use, what fonts I use, the shape of my box, where I put the words on the box, and what claims I try to make on the box. And the government comes in and, and has a number of rules you need to follow when you make these boxes as well. Is it fair for me as a business to try to sell you a granola bar that says it only has 50 calories in it when it actually has 250 calories in it? Yes, it's illegal to do that. Why? Because the government has regulations on that you can't mislead the consumer. That's just one small example of, of a regulation in food marketing. But this is just take this into account when we're talking about so many different products all funneling into about the, the 10 same businesses throughout the next few slides as well. Um, there is a key term I want you to know called a strategic business unit. This is not generally a term that comes into play when you talk agriculture, but it is one you should be aware of. And anytime you have a business, I'm going to say a corporation which is a business, that has a number of small successful products, all of a sudden it becomes very important that you manage each one of those as efficiently as possible. Like if I'm Coca-Cola and I come out with an offshoot of Coca-Cola and I'm just arbitrarily here going to say vanilla Coke, we're going to try a product called vanilla Coke, um, we're going to market it and all of a sudden it's selling. Like we just sold a billion cans of vanilla Coke. Well, it may not make sense for me to use my same team that marketed Coca-Cola to try to market vanilla Coke. Instead, I'm going to pull a couple of those executives, have them build their own team. They'll develop their own strategic business unit, and they're just going to oversee vanilla Coke. And there's a lot of benefits to subdividing your business and breaking it into strategic business units. So let's go back here. Let's take a look at Coca-Cola. Uh, well, if we branch out, Coca-Cola looks like they own Dasani. And Dasani, well, I'm going to assume, makes a tremendous amount of money for Coca-Cola. They wouldn't be doing it if it didn't. Well, it's not going to make sense for Coca-Cola to have a bottle of water that says Coca-Cola on it, and it's under it's going to say filtered water, and they're going to market it with the same distribution model they use Coca-Cola for. It's not efficient. And also, your target market buying Dasani doesn't want to see Coca-Cola on their product. They probably associate it with it being unhealthy. We also don't really care if our customers know that Dasani is owned by Coca-Cola. We legally have to put it on the bottle, but we're going to put it on the bottom in font size 8, where nobody looks under the barcode. My point being, Coca-Cola has a totally different and more efficient strategy 
to marketing Dasani by using a, pl a see-through plastic bottle with blue font that says Dasani that doesn't say Coca-Cola on it, and they're gonna market it entirely differently than they market Coca-Cola or their, their soda products. And that strategy is called a strategic business unit. Another good example here is Procter & Gamble. It's a publicly traded corporation, pretty successful for a number of decades. They own almost every toiletry product you have in your bathroom, which you would never know because it really, you'd have to hunt down on the label to find Procter & Gamble on all of them. But your toothpaste, your shampoo, even the toothbrush itself is probably produced by Procter & Gamble in these all different strategic business units. And it's crazy because you think, well, if the shampoo alone is making a million dollars a year, it makes sense to spend more money on just a strategic business unit for that $1 million stream of revenue than trying to manage everything under the umbrella of Procter & Gamble. How does this all relate to marketing and regulations? Well, we'll get there in a second. This is something that I spend a good chunk of the, ch the, the semester on in my food marketing class. I teach specifically a 300 level food marketing class. And we've got these aspects of strategic alternatives here. And this can be applied to ag commodities as well. But just take a look at some of these definitions here. Market penetration is when we're trying to increase market share among existing companies. And I'm going to use Apple as an example because even though I still don't quite understand it, Apple has a crazy user base with a number of really, really successful products. And I don't own any of them, but I respect them as being very good products. Market penetration with Apple would be well, we're going to try to come up with a new set of headphones that already fit the, the iPhones that our customers have. So we're trying to penetrate the market a little bit more efficiently, as in trying to sell something to people that are already our existing customers. That's market penetration. Uh, market development would be attracting new customers to existing products. So because I use an Android operating system, I think it's Motorola, I'm not an Apple user. Well, if Apple were to try to develop the market, market development, they're going to be using advertisements and strategies to get Android users to make the leap over to Apple products. You see this all the time with car commercials as well, but you, you see it a little bit less in agriculture, but it is still there. And there's just two more to run by here. Product development, creating new products for existing markets. So that's, I'm gonna come out with the iPhone 12 and try to get people who have the iPhone 10 and 11 to buy the new iPhone. That would be market development. And the last one, diversification. Brand new products into brand new markets. If Apple were to explore diversification here, what if they come out with, oh, Apple's gonna come out with its new electric self-driving car to try to compete with Tesla. Apple's not in the automotive industry. So if Apple were to try to make a car, they're trying to diversify their business model. All of these can be applied to the ag systems as well. A good example of this going on right now, has anybody in here, just briefly raise your hand, tried any of the new Beyond Meat, the new, yeah, okay, it's, it's interesting, I've tried it too. Uh, I, I mean, I don't wanna talk about how we feel about it, how it tastes, that's a cool discussion too, but there's this, that idea can be applied to a lot of the, these concepts on the board right now. Beyond Meat is a publicly traded corporation, you can go buy their stock if you want, I wouldn't advise that you do so, but you can do whatever you want with your money. Um, I don't think the company's gonna do very well in the long term, but I, I hope I'm wrong. So there's an interesting debate going on right now about how can Beyond Meat attract more customers who are meat eaters, people who normally eat beef. How do we get them to change their mind and buy a different product? And you can kind of see the point that I'm getting at. All three of these can be discussed in agriculture all the time. And it's kind of interesting how there seems to be these back and forth jabs between industries. Well, the plant-based industry is always trying to kind of show you reasons why you shouldn't be eating as much meat. And interesting marketing tactics are used. Some of them are scientifically valid. Some of them are loosely scientifically valid. And on the flip side, you've got the meat industry that is always trying to counter some of these claims by the vegetarian and vegan community so that you continue to buy their product. There is a legal battle going on right now between Beyond Meat and the four major meat producers. Because, it, and I hope I don't misspeak here because I, I'm not following the case closely. Beyond Meat used the term dirty meat when referring to traditional meat production. They also call themselves the clean meat alternative. And the lawsuit is claiming something like defamation where, hey, if I'm a cattle production, I don't want you calling my commodity dirty meat. I may raise these animals in an extremely ethical way. These animals are very clean. My production is very clean. I don't have any contamination. And I produce a really healthy quality product of meat. I don't want you calling my business dirty meat. I don't want you calling my commodity dirty meat. It taints the perspective of the market, right? 
If you've got a lot of people out there that are, their decisions are being based on news articles, which a lot of them are, I don't want you calling my commodity dirty meat and I don't want you calling yours clean meat. Well, the verbiage and terminology that you use in marketing is extremely important and can be the difference between a lawsuit or not. Next time you go to the store, I do want you to be looking at some of the labels on these products and I want you to take a step back and think, why did they put these words where they did? I promise you, it was a strategic decision made by somebody making a lot of money who understands psychology and how the markets work. Interesting things to talk about. Um, I'm going to... Oh, I just accidentally turned this off. I think we'll be good to go in a second. So kind of think about these as you go forward with buying your calories and, and moving forward. One second. Let me see if I can. I'm just going to unplug it and plug it back in. So this is a cool concept too, the cost competitive advantage. And I've got the examples here of Kia and Hyundai, although back when I made this slide, it, it, it made more sense than it does now because these car companies have actually kind of moved up the echelon where they are as far as this goes. Cost competitive advantage would be just being the low cost option in the market. That isn't necessarily a good or a bad thing, but think about the, some of the benefits you might have of um, marketing a product that is the lowest price available. There is a big part of the market that just wants to buy the lowest cost product, me being one of them. Usually my decisions are based on what product costs less most of the time. Another good example of this would be if they've ever had Shasta Cola. It's like Shasta Cola. Is it really that much different than Coca-Cola? I don't know. Could you taste test the difference? And if you can, is it worth a 50% premium for Coca-Cola? I don't know. It's up for you. to. That's your decision as the consumer. But this does happen in agriculture all the time. It's a really big topic right now with the organic industry. Is it worth paying more for organic food? I'm not going to give you my opinion on that. I'd rather you do some of your own research. I'd like to talk about it if anybody wants to. But is it worth paying 60% more for bell peppers that are organic versus that are traditionally grown? Well, the first question you should be asked is, what's the difference in organic production? It's about a 127-page document through the Cal Department of Food and Ag. It's a complicated topic. It's not as straightforward as you think. Most people think it's, well, there's no pesticides in organic. That's wrong. There's a tremendous amount of pesticides in organic food. Slightly different pesticides, but they're still pesticides. But anyway, let's roll through some of these slides more. Uh, ag policy is something that I spend a lot of time working on. Ag policy, it's this simple. Ag policy are laws that apply to agriculture. That's it. It's laws and regulations that apply to agriculture. You can Google the Food and Ag Code of California. It's a pretty dry document. It's a number of documents, but it's all legal code. And it's official legal documents as far as how you grow and distribute food in California. And also, it has a lot of different things to it as far as the labor, pesticide use, distributing across borders. Uh, a lot of interesting, I mean, it even has, uh, there's a whole page on there about what types of pesticides you can use around beehives. I mean, that's just kind of a loose example of it. I used to know this documentation a little bit more significantly when I worked for the government. Uh, but I'm going to give you a real quick example of a type of government regulation. There are over 250 types of plants that have been documented to be a host plant for a certain insect called glassy wing sharpshooter. The glassy wing sharpshooter can lay its eggs within the leaves of these plants, kind of like lays the eggs under the first layer of leaf. And it's hard to see the eggs because they're not really on the leaf, they're inside the leaf. Well, this insect just so happens to be able to spread a bacteria that kills grapevines. And you might be thinking like, what, who cares about grapevines? Well, the state of California does because it's a $4 billion, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. I'm not sure if four is the right number. And it's not because we like table grapes. Does anybody know why our wine industry is worth $4 billion? I just gave it away. It's our wine industry. I meant to say our grapes, but uh, it's our wine industry is worth that much money. Now, if you want to go down to Chile, that has more of a table grape industry. It's, and they do, there's wine there too. It's, it, Chile is an amazing agricultural country as well. But yeah, California's got 400 commodities that we produce here. And we don't just produce them, we profit from them. And that's a hard thing to do. And, and grapes are one of our, it's I think our number two commodity in the state. Well, that being said, if we have a big problem with a certain insect that lays its eggs, and these insects can potentially ruin our grapevines, we need to have regulations in place and we need to have a system of protection in place to make sure these insects don't get spread across borders. So a lot of my job was I would go to a business that is going to ship 250 plants in 10-gallon pots 
um, let's say Magnolia grandiflora. 250 Magnolia grandiflora in 10 gallon pots are going to go up north to Napa Valley. And Napa Valley has a lot of grapes. Napa Valley has regulations in place that require Riverside County to do a 100% inspection on those plants before they get shipped across the borders. And after you're done with your 100% inspection, you are going to spray Carborol all over these plants, which is a toxic chemical that you can't even go for the, towards those plants for 24 hours after the spray. You can't ship them for six days, and then you can send them up to us. And then there may even be a regulation depending on that commodity. It needs to be sprayed and held only inside a greenhouse before someone like me comes and signs off the paper and says, yes, you can ship these plant material. Real quickly, just because it's worth mentioning, the, well, the, the worst citation I ever had to write somebody, and I was very business friendly. I, I didn't really write people tickets if I didn't have to. I wrote a nursery in Paris, California, a ticket because the rule that they were breaking was they didn't have their pesticides behind a locked container. That's a very strict rule in this state. If you have pesticides, they need to be under lock and key at all times unless you're using them. That was the rule they broke. And I normally would not write someone up for that. I would just say, hey, you need to get a shed. It needs to have a lock on it, and that's it. And I wouldn't write a ticket for that. In this case, they had a 7-year-old and a 9-year-old that ran into the shed and loaded their super soakers with 7SL, which is a pesticide of carbaryl, and were chasing each other around the property, shooting each other with super soakers. Thankfully, carbaryl is a very thick pesticide. You need to mix an adjuvant with it for it to spray efficiently. An adjuvant in this case was a thinning solution that was so we could spray through a nozzle more efficiently. And they didn't have that, so it wasn't shooting super well, but they still had traces of it on their shirts. You can't do that. There are regulations against these things. That's the point that I'm trying to make. Uh, now, if you're interested in this, if any of you are actually interested in plant science or business of growing plants, uh, agriculture in general, you may be able to use the, these links in this class or other classes. And I believe that these pictures are actual links on the PowerPoint. If they're not, you can just type these things into Google. These are official government websites that break down everything you need to know about plants and regulations and insects as well. If you want to, like let's say, I, I've, I've had students in the past that have family in Mexico that work in agriculture and say, hey, so-and-so wants to ship me X, Y, and Z from a state in Mexico. Am I going to be able to do that? Well, off the top of my head, I don't know, but these websites will tell you everything to need to know, you need to know. You can go to National Plant Board. You can find whatever regulations we have coming out of a certain state in Mexico, and you can see what you have to do, who you need to call, what type of paperwork you need to get. Let's say I want to import some plants from Arizona. Well, because I was a biologist for the state, I know a lot about Arizona. There's almost nothing you need to worry about coming out of Arizona. There's no major viruses, there's no major bacteria, there's no major fungi, and there's no major insects we need to worry about. If somebody was importing something from Arizona as the, that was the grow yard, I would sign it off over the phone. I wouldn't even go do an inspection because I just know as a biologist there's nothing to worry about there. But let's say we have somebody importing Dracenia or some other type of crop uh, not crop, more of a decorative plant, from Costa Rica or Puerto Rico or Florida or anywhere where it's really humid. Oh, you're begging for nematodes. You're begging for fungus. There's probably going to be insect eggs all over those things. There are certain regulations you're going to have to follow. Whoever's going to ship you that plant is going to have to probably treat with pesticide and do an inspection and have an official sign off on that. When it arrives in California, you're going to have ag commissioners like myself used to be go do an inspection and sign off on paperwork. We have to do everything we can to protect the integrity of California's agriculture, right? We've got 400 commodities here we need to protect. We can't have a virus spreading through this state that attacks grapevines. It's a billion dollar industry. We can't risk a bacteria spreading through our pistachio and almond orchards that produces $2 billion a year for us. We can't risk something else that's going to attack our dairy cows and knock out a $7 billion industry that we have here. We have to protect the state's integrity by, in, in a sense, implementing government regulations. The USDA at the top, that's federal, United States, California, Department of Food and Ag, that's just state level. And then ag commissioners are counties. So you're, I'm almost positive we're in San Bernardino, San Bernardino County here. San Bernardino has its own ag commissioner's office. You can Google their number. And if you have any questions specific to agriculture around here, the ag commissioner's office in San Bernardino County can assist you with those things. If any of you have ever driven home from Las Vegas 
and you're tired, it's Monday morning and you don't feel too good, and you gotta go through a checkpoint. And some of you probably loosely remember that there is an ag checkpoint here on the way home from Nevada, but there is. There's actually a dozen or so of them all over the state. What you're looking at here, this is every major, I'm not gonna say freeway, but every major road into the state of California. Now, that's actually a small number of where our ag commodities come from. The majority of them are gonna come into the ports in either Long Beach or, or Northern, I'm gonna guess San Francisco. That's a huge amount of our commodities. Some will be flown in, but for the most part, they're gonna be brought in on ships, and then you do have a tremendous amount that are bringing in on, on cars, too. More often than not, they're gonna come in through the five freeway or through the 10 freeway through Blythe. The 10 freeway goes all the way into New Orleans, fun fact. But my point being, if you have an 18-wheeler, that's bringing in something like, I'm gonna, say, I'm gonna say soybeans, just for the sake of this. They're bringing in an 18-wheeler of just soybean through the 10 freeway. They're going to get stopped at this ag checkpoint. An official, a, a Cal state official is gonna come out and ask them, where are you coming from? And they'll probably be able to tell because the driver of the 18-wheeler has documentation of his shipment. He has to because there's government regulations in place that says he has to. He's gonna give the paperwork to the inspection station and they're gonna see, all right, we've got I don't know, X amount of tons of soybean coming from Iowa, and it's going to Victorville, California. The people behind this, these counters here fax the paperwork to this, the, the office in Victorville, California, and say, hey, you got an 18-wheeler coming in about an hour and a half. You need to do an inspection on this soybean before it goes on the shelves of Ralph's. Now, is soybean going to get conducted exactly that way? No. Each, each commodity is going to be a little bit different depending on whatever risks it poses. But that's the point that I'm trying to make. It's like, well, you have a tremendous amount of government regulation in place that is putting checks and balances into the shipments and consumptions of our food. And this is stuff that normal people don't even think about at all. We just go to the store, we spend a relatively low amount of money on food, and we eat it. And we never really take a step back and, and be thankful for the fact that it's low cost and the fact that it's healthy. Do you know how much potential risk there is in you consuming meat? I eat a lot of meat, I'm an omnivore, I'm not telling you not to eat meat, but you think about how long does meat have to be at room temperature before it becomes contaminated? I mean, turkey is like less than four hours, I think, it's pretty, pretty quick. How do you know that the meat you're buying at the store is safe to consume? Do you just trust the business and that, oh, I hope they produced it safely, I hope it didn't get to room temperature on its way here from Nebraska or wherever it came from, or Texas? There are certain government regulations in place and those regulations are to make sure you as the consumer and you as a one of 330 million people in this country have access to safe and healthy food. That's what a lot of your taxpayer money goes to, to fund the $155 billion USDA so that the USDA can come in and make sure that you have access to your chicken it has met certain safety requirements when you buy it. You know that your corn hasn't been mistreated with pesticides because there are certain regulations in place. Now, are those regulations at all swayed by big pesticide business? That's pos very possible, and that's a totally different discussion than talking about some of the basics that we have going on here. So I just have a couple more slides I want to get through because um, I am running out of time here. California has a most wanted pest list, and I've done some research on some of these insects, but essentially these, there's 12 here. I have another slide here. It's just six on the board right now. These are the 12 worst insects that we have in California. And as somebody who's an entomologist, this is where I, I could easily go off on a lot of tangents, and I, I'm trying not to. This Japanese beetle is not the same as the June bug that you see. Well, it's actually a fig-eating beetle. It's not the same. It's in the same family. It's a scarab beetle. But this is a huge defoliator. Let's say you're an ornamental grower, and you have something like, oh, I'm going to grow a bunch of bottle brush. I'm going to grow some calistemon. I'm going to grow some magnolia. Um, this has chewing mouth parts and if there's an outbreak on your on your land this can just defoliate it can chew all your crops nobody wants to buy your bottle brush plant if 80 percent of it was consumed by a beetle it's not good we need to make sure we protect our ag industry by preventing the spread of a lot of these right here mediterranean fruit fly is responsible i mean it's it's under control now but it has cost us over a hundred million dollars a year before in just con eating fruit if there's an outbreak especially well, I'm gonna say in a warehouse, although it's easy to control them in a warehouse. If you have an outbreak, all of a sudden your commodities are gonna be filled with eggs, filled with larvae, and the larvae have chewing mouth parts and they're just gonna eat the crops. And now you can't sell them. The definition of a pest is anything that costs producers money, lost money. If, if I have a pest that eats even 10% of my yield, it's cost me money and, and that's the definition of a pest. Here are the six other ones. Um, I've done a lot of work with capra beetle. 
it doesn't even look like a beetle first off. It's like, it just looks like a pebble. It actually does have six legs. It's got a chewing mouth part. It's got lamellate antenna. It's interesting that this one beetle, I'm not talking about a family, like an entire family of beetles. One beetle species is responsible for 25% of all grain lost in this country. So you might think like, wait a second. So you mean to tell me all the grain we produce in this country, we lose 20 to 25% of it every year from one beetle? That is correct. Wow. So this one beetle has a huge effect into the economics of grain in this country. This one beetle is driving prices of grain up by reducing the supply of the grain. Yeah. And it can live for nine months without food. It can go into diapause where it shuts off its metabolism and can just live in cement cracks. And it can even come in contact with pretty heavy duty pesticides and just kind of brush it off. No big deal. Going to go lay some eggs, going to reproduce, going to be a thousand more of me in a matter of weeks. Yeah, and that's pretty crazy that even our best entomologists have trouble controlling this. And that loose idea applies to all 12 of these. They are costing agriculture significant money. Now, there's a lot of insects that aren't ag pests, like mosquitoes are pests of more so human beings, but that's kind of a different discussion. These insects are all pests specifically towards agriculture. Now, I've got just a couple more slides here, but I just kind of want you to take a step back and think, how much should the government be able to regulate? Like, do, I, do you agree that you have to be 21 years old to buy alcohol? I mean, I don't care what your perspective is, but that's a government regulation. Real quickly, the difference between a law and a regulation is that laws are put forth by the federal government as a blanket statement, and regulations are how you choose to interpret those laws, state by state. What I mean by that, and this is the example that I like to give all my ag students because it seems to make the most sense to them. There is a federal law in place that cannabis is illegal, but there are regulations state by state that puts forth certain parameters that need to be met. Like California says, you know, you can have up to X amount of it and it's okay. But it's like, well, it's illegal federally. That's confusing. Yeah, it is. Laws are confusing. And I don't really, I mean, I could never be a lawyer if you want to. Bless you. I, I hope you make it all the way. It's hard to do. Interpreting the law is difficult. But my point being, laws are federal blanket, blanket rules and regulations are how each state chooses to interpret and enforce those rules. There may be a different penalty in Nebraska for drinking under 21 than there is in California. Why? Because there's different regulations between those two states, right? Things to think about. What about, man, I feel like I could talk to you guys all day about this because I am passionate about the topics. Do you think it's fair that there are regulations on tobacco? I don't know. That's up to you. But those are regulations. That's my point. Tobacco is something like a $124 billion industry, and it's agriculture. It, it is absolutely agriculture. Do you think that's ethical? I don't, well, that's a different discussion. But my point being that there are regulations in place. I mean, they don't even let you market those. When was the last time you saw a cigarette commercial, right? You, there are regulations that you cannot market these. And in certain states, you need to show birth defects on the packaging. You need to show what it does to your mouth. You need to show what a tumor looks like. Those are regulations that put, are put in place for how to market something. Um, so I just explained the laws versus regulations. Um, there's a link here to give you some examples of maybe a time where the regulation went a little bit too far and it was counterproductive to what it was trying to regulate. Um, and there's a big debate in politics. You've got one group that's kind of like, let the free market rule, let the businesses do whatever they want. The, the market will naturally balance itself out. And you've got another group that thinks the government should be bigger and try to put checks and balances everywhere and balance it out. And, that's, and those are interesting things to discuss. Um, couple statistics to just run by here really quick. Um, how you define a living wage is things like access to food, access to clothing, access to housing, access to education, access to healthcare, and access to a savings or a bank of some kind. Well, in order to do that in California, you need to make $57,000 a year. Not if you're going to live anywhere near LA. You're going to need a lot more than that. Not if you're going to live anywhere near San Francisco. You're going to need a lot more than that. Well, my point being that the USDA is looking at these numbers all the time and making decisions based off of them. But do understand how averages are calculated. It's going to cost you a lot more than $50, $57,000 a year to live in San Jose as opposed to living in Blythe, right? Those, there's different costs associated with those things. How much does it cost to buy a home in California? The average is over $600,000. But again, that's taking into account some really, really multi, multi, multi million dollar properties on the coast too. If we take out those outliers in the data, it still costs a lot of money to live in California. Why? Well, we can answer some of those questions through supply and demand, through other economic concepts, and through laws and regulations. 
There are housing regulations in place and some people think that manipulating those could either raise or decrease rent prices. Well, that's an economic discussion. Those same discussions happen all the time with our food system as well. What I'm showing you here is that everybody has some sort of stake into a company. And I'm gonna give you the example. Let's talk about Walmart here. And the point that I'm, is it okay if I go a little longer, Neville? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, please. So there's oftentimes regulations that are talked about, like we need to change the way Walmart is operating their business. And I'm gonna use Walmart as an example here, but every time I mention Walmart, I also want you to be kind of thinking in your head, what about a big farm as well? Let's say we wanna regulate Walmart. We wanna make them either raise their minimum wage, we want to do X, Y, Z, whatever other changes you wanna make put forth in Walmart. Well, let's think about who might be impacted by those decisions. You have people internally that would be impacted. You've got the employees, like their wages are gonna go up. Okay, they're gonna be impacted by that. Well, you've got managers. How are they going to be impacted? That's, okay, that's debatable. And then you've got the owners. In this case, I'm gonna say the shareholders, people who own shares of Walmart. Although that's mentioned over here as well. Owners do have tremendous amount of shares of publicly traded companies. You can all just, also just think executives as well. Well, what about people on the outside, external, outside the company? Well, you've got suppliers. Like, let's say that you run a farm and you sell all your commodities to go on the shelf of Walmart. Major decisions in the structure of Walmart are going to affect the suppliers in some way. I mean, think about how many suppliers there are to Walmart. How many different items are there in a Walmart? You can get a pack of beer, you can get an oil change, you can buy cigarettes, you can buy clothes. Like, there's a lot of suppliers that funnel into Walmart. If you make changes into Walmart, and I'm not referring to just minimum wage, if the government steps in and regulates a business, it's going to have a ripple effect through everything that you see on the board. Society will get affected. What if prices of everything go up and then you have to spend more money at Walmart because the government changed some rules? I'm not saying it's necessarily gonna play out that way, but these are possibilities that happen. Well, the government, because think about the government, man, there are 2.2 million employees that work for Walmart. It's the largest employer next to the government. It's the largest private employer in this country. Well, what about the government who is collecting income tax off of all 2.2 million of those people? What about the government who's collecting sales tax when all 2.2 million of those people go and spend their paychecks throughout the world? The government is going to be affected by the own, its own decisions that it makes. Creditors who establish line of credit, even if you're Walmart and even if you, Walmart, this is crazy, Walmart made $500 billion of revenue last year. That's half a trillion. 500, it was the highest earning company. $500 billion in revenue. That's crazy. So anyway, uh, even though they make a lot of money, they do still take out lines of credit. So if you're a bank issuing lines of credit to Walmart, you're gonna, might be affected by it too. And then lastly, the customers. Well, Walmart has, the data shows something like 60% of this country has shares of Walmart in their, their retirement account. And you might be thinking, well, well, how? Well, that's getting into mutual funds and, and ETFs and retirement accounts. But yeah, Walmart, the, over half this country, if you work full time, you already, if anybody in here works full time, you own shares of Walmart, you are a part, part Walmart owner, congratulations. Um, these are interesting things to think about. So if you have a billion outstanding shares and the government makes regulations to a company that causes those share prices to go up or down, think about you're affecting the price of all of those shares. You're affecting the net worth of millions of people when these decisions are made. Whether or not they're good or bad depends on the decision, depends on your perspective on a lot of different things. It's important to under, what, understand what gross domestic product is. You don't need to know this fancy equation. You just need to understand it's the total number of goods and services produced in a year by a country. That can be all ag production, all automotive production, everything. All production and services in a country is the GDP. The United States is by far and away the highest in GDP in the world. And again, regardless of your perspectives on the current economy, the current administration, et cetera, our economy seems to be doing well. Our ag system seems to be doing well. It seems like what we have in place is working, and it's been working for a long time. China's close second, but they're still, they're, maybe I wouldn't say close second, but they're in second. And then the list here, United States and Japan are the top three. Now, just real quickly, let's look at Germany, number four. Germany's number one economic driver is automotive parts and cars. They ship cars all over the world. So let's say that you make a regulation specifically to your auto industry. If it's your biggest economy, you need to really think about this thoroughly because you're going to be affecting your country's number one moneymaker. So to give you an example of that in California, dairy is our number one ag moneymaker. It makes over $7 billion a year. 
And there are a tremendous amount of, well, there is a large amount of pollution that comes out of the dairy industry and it can affect the ecosystems around it. So the government of California will step in and say, we're going to pass Senate Bill 1383 and it has to reduce our methane by, the dairy industries need to reduce their methane by 40%. Wow, that's a, big, that's a big number, man. These cows are burping and, and excreting waste all the time and producing methane in the environment. So you're going to have the state come in and say, dairy farmers, you need to clean up your operation. You need to reduce methane. Well, for the dairy operator to do that, they either need to spend money on expensive digesters or reduce their, their herd, right? Reduce the number of animals you have. Well, does that mean that I'm going to lower my yield? I'm going to produce fewer gallons of milk and that's going to drive prices of milk up. I'm not saying that's necessarily what's going to happen or necessarily my perspective, but these are questions you have to be asking yourselves when you are implementing regulations, especially on a major economic, money, or economic driver. This data can be interpreted in a number of different ways. Uh, from left to right, you have different income groups. So you've got the lower end of society here making fewer than $15,000, $30,000, $40,000 a year. And then you've got the much higher earners earning a quarter million dollars a year. What this is showing you is that, look at the chunks of red here. That's how much each group spends on housing, what percent of their disposable income they spend on housing. So you've got lower earners spend much more of their paycheck on housing than the rich do. That's data that the government can look at and try to, well, what can we do to spread out some equality here to make regular? Should we put some sort of regulations on rent control? I mean, maybe, I don't know the answers to that. I'm just showing you some data and how we can make decisions based on data. But look here in the blue on food and beverage. That is relatively the same across all the income groups. Whether that's good or bad, I, I don't know. That's up for you to interpret as an educated adult, but I'm just kind of showing you we can do a lot with data, but always ask yourself, how is the data collected? What were the methods used to collect that data? Because the methods aren't always as ideal as you'd like them to be. There may be flaws in it. Um, just for the sake of time, I'm going to skip this slide because if I start talking about this, it's going to be 30 minutes. Uh, I love talking about what this pyramid of social responsibility is, but here's something I'd like you to do. It's going to take you five minutes. Sometime later today, just go on YouTube and type in the Pyramid of Social Responsibility and just watch a five minute video on it. It's a really cool ethical, I mean it's talked about in business ethics all the time as far as what should a business be responsible for? Should the business's responsibility be to produce as much corn as possible or should the business's responsibility be economically viable and make a profit? Should it be both those things? There's not a clear cut answer on that and this has been fought about in many court cases as far as what the role of a corporation and business should be. So just kind of maybe do some research on that if you get a chance to. Um, and I keep accidentally turning this off in all my fidgeting. So, so man, I, Neville, I wanted to keep this under 45 minutes. I apologize. Um, are we running out of tape at all or we're good? No, we're good. Okay. Um, I want you also to think about the strategies. And I, I love talking about marketing. It's really interesting. I want you to think about the different products Coca-Cola has. And if you're not aware of them, I'll give you a couple different ones. But what I mean by that is the main Coca-Cola, I'm not talking about Coca-Cola, vanilla, anything like that. Like their flagship product, Coca-Cola. Buy it in San Diego and LA. It is a different mixture than if you buy it in Mexico City. It's a different mixture than if you buy it in Italy. It's a different mixture than if you buy it in Germany. But it's marketed the same as Coca-Cola. Now, and you remember we talked about strategic business units. This isn't the same as strategic business unit. This is something called a multi-domestic strategy in how you market your product. We found market data that people out of Italy like a different taste in their soft drink than people in the United States. So Coca-Cola knows that and Coca-Cola is going to exploit some of that data and produce a different product for a different market. Uh, this happens in agriculture too. Um, I can give you a couple examples of that, but I just want you to understand this term, a multi-domestic strategy. It's important in economics and it's important in marketing. Uh, when a company, and I've got another example here, Shasta Cola versus LaCroix. One example you might have is I'm going to have a different product that I market to somebody who makes $40,000 a year than, I, than somebody who's making $400,000 a year. Although the product might be identical, I'm going to market to you as if it's not. And is there ethics involved there? Sure. But I want you to think about all the different types of products you have. They all have a different type of target market. They're trying to attract different types of customers. Um, I know I'm bouncing around a little bit here. If you've got more time, and, and I know Professor Neville will post this online, this is a link showing you all the different types of products McDonald's has across the planet. 
a totally different menu out of somewhere in, let's say, South Korea than the menu in the United States. Completely different. They may not even have like a Big Mac. It might not exist in South Korea because it doesn't sell well. They've got a different product that takes the place of that. Actually, this might be that link for what I was just explaining. Uh, well, why? Because they have a multi-domestic strategy in place. They're trying to exploit the marketplace as efficiently as possible. Does this happen? In, I mean, this is, I mean, McDonald's is an agriculture company. They sell food. I view them as an ag company. They're not a producer. They're not a grower, but they're still an ag company. Um, you're probably familiar with what a tariff is. You should be. I mean, a few, it's probably been a year now. Um, we had uh, some rough discussions in our government about as far as tariffs in place between certain countries. I'm going to give you an example of the purpose of a tariff because most people I talk to don't quite understand what tariffs are. Let's say that here in the United States, we have a huge lumber industry, and I'm just making this up. Let's say out of Minnesota, there's a huge lumber industry, and we've got buyers all over the country that buy lumber from Minnesota, and there's a big economy in Minnesota for all this lumber, right? Big business, a lot of money being made, a lot of gener generating tax revenue from it. It's good for our government. But then all of a sudden, you've got a grower in Canada who has all this lumber at a really low cost. Like they're undercutting Minnesota's lumber industry by half or something. They're selling to everyone in the United States, well, we're just going to go buy our lumber from Canada. It's a lot cheaper there. Well, the government wants to protect our state. It wants to protect Minnesota's economy. They might put a tariff in place and say, look, if you want to import lumber from Canada, you're going to need to pay twice as much for it or you're going to have to pay like 110%. We're going to create a tariff in place to make it that Minnesota's lumber is the cheapest you can buy. So your money goes to Minnesota and not the other country. That is a crude, rough example of a tariff. Where does that money go? The government. It's a tax. It's just a tax. It's a fancy word for tax. And there's a lot of data that shows who pays the tax, the citizens of the country you're implementing the tariff on. Like, it's not just going to harm Canada. The intent is to harm Canada's lumber industry so that money flows back into the Minnesota, our country doesn't always work as implemented. I mean, you've got all kinds of like book economics, like what you learn in the class versus applied economics, and those are oftentimes don't always play out equally. Um, but it, it is important. I mean, th the tariffs right now with China have to do a lot with soybean and corn, ag, ag commodities. As far as marketing goes, I just got one, a couple pictures to show you. I think this is really deceiving and misleading. This is a jar of what was dried fruit. I found this online. And there's a hollow cone that sits in the jar that you're getting about 40% less than what the container looks like you're getting. That happens a lot more than you think. Like imagine if you're going to go buy like a box of toothpaste, it's like a, you know, a tube, and then you open it up and it's in a smaller plastic tube that is like only 80% of the size of the container. There's reasons why for shipping that we do that, but a lot of the times what you think you're getting is slightly different than what you're actually getting. And I think this is an example of kind of deceiving food marketing. It's like I'm only getting 40% of what this container looks like I'm getting. The quantity does legally have to be labeled on the box. Some commodities are in actual quantity, like one through 10. Some commodities are done by weight. Like grapes, you're not gonna count all those grapes. It's gonna be done by weight. Melons will be done by actual count, things along those lines. All right, just a couple more slides here. I've done a lot of research in the citrus industry and I'm showing you essentially four different types of citrus products you could buy at the store. Wow, a lot, lot to choose from here. This is, even though it's a strawberry sea, it is a competitive, competing product, so I'm gonna keep it on the board. But it's like I can buy this cardboard box of citrus orange juice. I can buy this plastic weird cone shape, you know, got some curves to it. Here's another cardboard box. Wow, wh what's the difference between all of these? Are they coming from the same grower? Yeah, some of these are going to be coming from the same yard. Why are they in different containers being marketed to me by different companies? These are really interesting questions to ask. Why is it that this is cardboard and this is plastic? Why is it that this one says 100% natural and this one has it in a different font and a smaller font? There's reasons why. I mean, there's strategic psychological reasons why. There's some really cool glasses we can put on people, test subjects right now. You put these glasses on and it watches where your eyes go. It's interesting to watch the behavior of human beings' eyesight. But essentially, let's say you were all wearing those glasses. I'm curious which one of these you looked at first. And the marketers absolutely know that. And if we have a test group of 500 people that all looked at this one first, well, you better believe the next product I make is going to be that shape. It's going to have that curve at the top. It's going to have those colors. Because for whatever reason, it attracted all your eyes to it. Interesting things to think about. Um, here's another one. I kind of am curious which one of these you looked at first. There's, they're, they're all the same product. They're all baby carrots. But look at some, I mean, it's kind of grainy here. 
Baby carrots in an interesting font, all caps, with a cartoon character. Clearly marketed towards people with kids, right? I would assume it's marked towards children. I don't have children, but if any of you do have children, I bet you can relate to how they run towards certain colors and certain cartoon characters and certain things attract them. Marketing companies know that. This one, probably not marketed towards kids, probably marketed towards more of an adult community. I'm just trying to show you some other examples of, man, there's so many strategies. There is, it's just sensory overload when you go to the grocery store with the amount of different ag products that you have. Like I mentioned before, when you buy meat and you know it's safe to consume, it's largely due to this subsection of the USDA, Food Safety and Inspection Service, FSIS. And they hire, I mean, they hire a lot of people. There's a lot of summer internships available where you can be an inspector for one summer. If any of you, I mean, maybe want to do it. It doesn't require a bachelor's degree. It's really cool to put on your resume too. You may spend a summer going to dairies and, and inspecting certain things on dairy cows and making sure there's um, certain quality, like cleanliness in place with a lot of the products so that you know when you go to the store, you're buying a safe product to consume. All right. This is a cool case study in marketing. It's going to be the last thing I talk about before we're done for the day. These are two products by the same producer, the same company. I don't necessarily know if they're from the same citrus grower, but it's the same company, Tropicana. And they had this product here. It was selling well, good numbers, very profitable. They decided we're going to rebrand our product. We're going to brand it like this. Well, what's changing? We're going to take a picture of a physical fruit with a straw in it, scratch it. We're going to put a plastic glass on there and let the consumer see the product, like see the orange juice. All right, well, no pulp changed from a red background to actual red font on top of the citrus. We're going to get rid of the circular cap. We're going to put some sort of rounded cap on it. Uh, other than that, not too much looked like it changed. And for whatever reason, they thought this was going to be a good idea. Well, this happened in 2009. And this is a case study done in marketing all the time as far as why did it fail? And it failed tremendously. Um, I have some statistics. I thought I had some st the specific statistic here. This change in box dropped sales by about 35 to 40 percent. 35 to 40 oh, you mean almost half of your customers stopped buying your product when you changed the box from this to that? Why? That's, a, that's an interesting thing to discuss psychologically. Why is it that 40% of your market changed their mind based on just this change of the product? Were there competitors at Ford? Like, did a new product hit the shelf? Maybe. Was, I don't know. That was stealing target market. I don't know. But these are things that I kind of want you to think about. I mean, think about how many choices you have at the grocery store. It's like 30,000. There's 30,000 different products you can buy at the grocery store. Why do you make the decisions that you make specifically? There's some interesting psychology at play in there in, in marketing. Now, why is any of this important? Well, our population is growing. We're at 7.7 .7 billion. We're on track for 9 billion by 2050. You got to feed and clothe those people. You got to do it efficiently. And you need to make sure they have access to inexpensive food so they're not spending all their money on it. And you need to make sure that they have access to safe food. And you need to make sure that they have access to safe housing and health care and education, and all of these things have factors of economics and regulations in place. And this is just scratching the surface of all this. And all of this ties into agriculture because everybody has to eat. How you feed nine, we can, we can feed nine billion people. We can do it with the methods we have right now. But I don't think we can do it forever. It's not sustainable. We need to make some changes in the long run. Um, just one more chart to show you. I've, I know I've said that a few times and you guys are probably like, when is this going to finish? But this is really cool data to show you. The green bars at the bottom are how much money is being spent by, by United States citizens. Uh, more than ever. I mean, the economy, I mean, people do have a disposable income. You can see the data over, I mean, we're, we're going back many, many years here. And yes, there's things to take into account like inflation, like the, uh, the cost, no, we're spending more money, there's inflation involved. But we're spending more and more money, yet we are downtrending in the cost of food, as in people are spending more money, but they're spending less of it on food. That is something you should be very thankful for. That is an amazing aspect of this country. Look at other parts of the world. So the, the lighter color here is where you don't, we don't have data coming from a lot of this continent, but like Australia is a little bit more expensive than we are. Um, Canada is a little bit more expensive. Mexico is much more expensive. But in the United States, we're spending not very much of our money on food. But Europe, Russia, China, the Middle East, South America, they're spending a lot of their money on food. And it isn't always as safe as the food here either. So you're getting access to very safe food at a very low cost. It's a very wonderful thing to be thankful for here in the United States.
And like I said, there's a lot more we could talk about, but we can only go over so much in an hour. I really appreciate you guys listening to me ramble at you for over an hour. I wanted to give, just do 